hi again, everybody, and welcome to Intersections of Gender's uh, Research Friday series. My name is Nat Hurley. Uh, I'm the Associate Director for Intersections of Gender, as well as an Associate Professor in the Department of English and Film Studies and the Director of Media and Technology Studies in the Faculty of Arts. Um, thank you all for coming to hear Tommy Mayberry today. We're so excited about this. And so before I introduce Tommy formally, uh, I want to recognize the conditions of possibility for our work here at the University of Alberta, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the lands of the Métis Nation Region 4. We work and live on the traditional lands of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. Like all our institutions, the U of A continues to be shaped by the forces of colonialism to the benefit primarily of white settlers. I consider myself to be an implicated subject who recognizes that the work of being in good relations through Indigenous colleagues, communities, staff members, and students is very much ongoing. I'd also like to say a bit about Research Fridays. We imagine this space as a venue for you to share and promote your research and thinking, or even just to host a conversation in lunch hour bite-sized pieces. So if you have a work in progress, a conference paper you've already given or want to give as a practice, if you have a poster, a book to discuss, or you just wanna talk about teaching or something cool that you've read with others, please let us know. We're really happy to respond to anything and to curate the events that the community really wants to have. We suggest keeping presentations to about 20 minutes, but the most important thing is that we create space and time for discussion and engagement. And we typically run these in webinar format, but we are also open to alternative formats and styles. So if you have an idea, please feel free to pitch it to us and we will work with you to make it so. Um, today is our event with Dr. Tommy Mayberry. I just also want to announce our next event, which will be held on February 4th, and that will feature Dr. Colleen Norris from the Faculty of Nursing. Her talk will center around the following question. Is the inertia of women's heart health, health outcomes, heart health outcomes, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a tongue twister, uh, a question of intersectional stereotyping? So it will be same time, same place in two weeks from today. And now, without further ado, our main event. Uh, allow me to introduce the fabulous Tommy Mayberry. Uh, Tommy uh, is the Executive Director for the Centre for Teaching and Learning here at the University of Alberta, and they are joining us for a talk that explores visual pedagogy through a sincere and earnest look at their own life, one congruent of academic and drag cultures of traditional teaching and dragged up pedagogies. They bring together a constellation of transgender visuality, queer phenomenology, and visual performance as a social justice leader with an anti-imperialist inclusive practice. Fabulous in every way. So before, um, I turn it over. I will also say that Tommy is a scholar, professional, and academic drag queen with a background in diverse teaching and instructional facilitation in academia as well as in industry. He's a, they are a sought after speaker on the topics of gender pronouns and cultures of respect, as well as on visual pedagogies and LGBTQIA inclusivity. Tommy has presented their scholarship and research findings nationally as well as internationally in places such as Oxford, Washington, DC, Tokyo, and Honolulu. They strive to embody and model decolonial, anti-racist, and equity-driven intersectional visions and leadership. So without further delay, Tommy Mayberry, please share your screen. Thank you, Nat, and hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen to bring up my slides so we have something to look at other than me. And I think those are being shared. So um, we will get started. As as Nat said, I'm Tommy Mayberry. My pronouns are he, she, and they. So you can use any of those three series to refer to me with respect. And I'm the executive director at the Center for Teaching and Learning here. Um, my email address is there as well as my Twitter handle if you want to reach out and connect with me in any capacity uh, would be great. Um, I want to start off with my own kind of land story because I am still actually, um, uh, Nat and I were talking before about, um, I don't even really have a spatial location on campus here yet at the University of Alberta. Um, I am just coming up on, on my six months um, being here at the, the U of A, and I moved here with my family um, from southwestern Ontario um, in Kitchener-Waterloo, just outside of Toronto. And so um, I really understand my relationship to the land as a, a white, queer, and trans settler scholar um, now as this kind of journey of um, two rivers, this kind of story of moving river to river, because I, I grew up um, in a trailer park in Westmount Rose in Ontario, Canada, which is the uh, photo of the, the bottom right there, along the Grand River. Um, and growing up here, 
before the pools would be open in the summers and things like that, my friends and siblings and I would, you know, put on what we called our river shoes and our bathing suits and we would go swimming in the, the waters of the Grand River. And I grew up um, my whole life with, with this body of water kind of connecting me and anchoring me to, to the land. And, you know, this river and, and the, the shores and the banks and the brush really felt like they were mine and my friends is, and, you know, we created these stories and these quests as we played and, and you know, learned and, and grew along this river. Um, and when I started working in um, full-time academic work at the University of Waterloo, we were responding to the, the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission around um, critically reflecting on how our institutions came to be on these lands. And I remember being quite shocked and affectively shook when the University of Waterloo, um, you know, wrote the, the land acknowledgement around being on the Haldeman Tract, which is land on 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River that was promised to the First Nations and was never delivered. And so learning about that, you know, as an, as an adult, thinking about how to do this work and seeing that the land that I grew up on and thought was my own um, was never delivered to the people who were there well before my ancestors came over and settled on this. And I, I still, um, to this day, struggle with these competing histories around, around the land. Um, the land that I thought was mine, but was never meant to be. Um, the land that was promised to other folks and also was never given to them. Um, and, and thinking about those relationships to the land has really forced me to consider and think through the ways that we learn, but also the ways that we have to unlearn pieces of how we were taught and, and what we came to um, learn and discover so that we can relearn um, new and powerful ways going forward. And so six months ago when my uh, partner, who also has the same name, Tommy, so if you hear me you know, slip into an anecdote about um, Tommy, um, that is my partner, Tommy. Um, we took our, our 16 and a half year old Pekingese Chihuahua in our car and we drove out um, you know, thinking of the pandemic, we didn't cut through the, the states. We drove up through northern Ontario and then out west to, to Edmonton. And I knew it was coming, um, you know, the North Saskatchewan River um, that Edmonton is settled around. Um, I knew it was coming, but, but getting here and seeing the river and feeling the, these connections again to important bodies of water and thinking about the history of this land now called Edmonton. Um, you know, that original name was Amiskachi Waskigan or Beaver Hills House and thinking about Treaty 6 territory and learning about the homeland of the Métis. Um, as I continue learning, unlearning and relearning about lands, I'm very conscious of um, how much land, um, how many nations, how many territories across this nation we now call Canada, uh, my family and I drove through and experienced as we were moving our life from one part um, to another. And so um, for this land story, I want us to, to you know, challenge ourselves to think about our own connections, our own histories to land, and those competing narratives that we may be thinking and feeling about um, together in, in ourselves. I also want to start off by acknowledging that I am a white person. Um, I have the incredible privilege um, and relative safety of walking around as a queer and trans person in a white body, um, you know, not walking quite yet on um, the University of Alberta campus in, in Edmonton here, but um, I am able, as a queer and trans person, as a, as a white person, I'm able to do this in relative safety um, because of non-white folks, um, you know, to, to paraphrase a, a phrase from Jack Halberstam, um, my ancestors um, who paved the way, led the way. And so three folks, not the first three, not the only three, but three folks that I want us to, to also kind of have with us today as, as we're thinking through um, our own embodied um, raced identities as people are Marsha P. Johnson, Stormy Delarvery, and Sylvie Rivera, who you may or may not know or think of as the, um, the activists and the, you know, the fighters from the Stonewall riot. Um, that happened in the, the early hours of, of June 28th and then into June 29th in 1969, where the police for the upteenth time were interrupting, disrupting, corrupting the, the space of the, um, the Stonewall Inn, and they were arresting people, beating people, and these three folks um, had, a, had enough. And so, you know, uh, what's now become myth in, in, in culture, and so we don't quite know which one was first or which one the pieces were, but Marsha is famously remembered as throwing the first brick at the police. Storm A is remembered for throwing the first punch at the police. And Sylvia is remembered for throwing the first bottle at the police. So lots of things thrown, bricks, rock, bricks, um, punches, bottles and things. But these three folks here um, are not white people. Um, these three folks who um, had the courage, the bravery, the, the rage, the frustration at, at the system and at the police to, to act um, 
paved a way that largely still today um, uplifts and upholds white intersectionality. As I said, I'm a white person um, who's a queer and trans person, specifically a trans feminine person. And um, I'm able to be in a position like executive director with different ease through privilege, um, where my whiteness cannot sometimes um, forgive or not draw attention to those other intersections of being equity denied. So I want us to think through intersectionality and I want us to think through our own um, visibly raced identities and embodiments. Because as we are gonna be talking about today, visual pedagogies and how teaching can be a, um, a drag or drag show, um, I do want us to look, um, I want us to look at whiteness. I want us to talk about whiteness. I want us to be critical of whiteness as well um, because there's a danger in colonial systems in having whiteness be and remain invisible. Um, and we're talking about visuality today. So um, as we as we get, I'm seeing a comment that they threw a lot of shade too. I am totally mopping that and I am totally going to be stealing that to use that it was bricks, bottles, fists and shade that were being thrown. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you, Nat. Um, so for visual pedagogy, um, to, to get us into this specifically and to think through some of the background and setup of how I arrived at, at this work in visual pedagogy, because you may have seen the title of the talk and thought, I've never really seen or heard of, you know, pedagogy with an adjective in front of it as visual. Or maybe you had and you thought this is interesting. Um, my background is, my disciplinary background is specifically in fine art studio and English language and literature. Um, so you'll kind of see a combination of um, language and studio practice coming through a lot of my work as well. And so to get us really thinking, I do want us to pay attention at this point to the singular pedagogy here. So this is visual pedagogy. And I'm gonna um, take a moment now to talk about um, the background and setup around here. So visual pedagogy, um, there's a book from 2002 um, by Brian Goldfarb called Visual Pedagogy, Media Cultures in and Beyond the Classroom. And this book, um, Goldfarb's research was largely premillennial, as we know how slow academic publishing can be. Um, you know, the work done before the turn of the millennium, and then you know, polishing, publishing, getting it into press um, for 2002. But this book is a premillennial book. It's looking kind of at the um, the 1950s to, to the kind of 1990s culture around um, what Goldfarb sets up as this burgeoning visual culture that we were seeing happen in that half century before the, the new millennium. And he sets up the book um, to be looking at the role of the visual and media in broader cultures of education and pedagogy during that late 20th century. Um, so this is um, the first book that put visual in front of pedagogy to look at what this might do in these media cultures in and beyond the classroom. I should also note um, that a lot of my work was done pre-pandemic. Um, so if you're feeling a little bit of that affective whiplash as we're talking about media cultures in and beyond the classroom, neither Goldfarb's work nor my work largely that is just about to be impressed on this um, was conceived or written um, in the pandemic. So there's a kind of visual pedagogies 2.0 or 3.0 that we can and should be doing around um, media cultures in pandemic um, and post-pandemic pieces. We can talk about that um, today for sure, but just in case you're going through and you're thinking, Tommy, you're not paying attention to the pandemic at all. Um, I'm blaming the slowness of the academic publishing industry on that again. Um, so yes, this book, um, I have a critique on that and you'll have a critique on my critique in a retro circular kind of way for it. Uh, but I wanted to start talking about Goldfarb because he is the first one who put visual in front of pedagogy in a large project kind of way um, for us to grow and build on. Um, he also talked about visual culture. And so from my background with um, visual studies, you know, Marita uh, Sturkin and Lisa Cartwright's uh, 2008 book, Practices of Looking and Introduction to Visual Culture, a textbook that I often teach from as well. They do a fantastic job of framing visual culture as this idea of the shared practices of a group, a community, or a society through which meaning is made out of visual, aural, and textual worlds of representation. And so the ways that looking practices are engaged in symbolic and communicative activities. So a, a kind of hefty definition that for me as I'm thinking through it and as I write about, um, I situate visual culture as linking concepts of visuality, orality, and textuality into a network of socially symbolic signifiers that represent and guide our collective practices of looking. Um, 
Mika Ball talks about visual essentialism. So this idea that there's a visual difference or a visual purity of images and this desire in an idea of visual essentialism to stake out the turf of what visuality would be against other media or other semiotic systems or ways of seeing or knowing. Um, and so what Ball specifically says, which I draw a lot on, is this idea that the act of looking, that act of sight is profoundly impure. So it's not something that you can actually say, this is just visual, because vision itself is inherently synesthetic. It is multi-sensory. It's bringing in, as Sturkin and Cartwright talk about, oral cultures, oral cultures, textual cultures, ways of hearing, ways of seeing. You know, we can even get to things that as well when we're thinking about ways of smelling or tasting or the haptic as well as this kind of multi-sensory synesthetic way of, of knowing and understanding and learning. Um, so visual pedagogy for me isn't about saying it's just about the visual. It's about this network of, of these socially symbolic signifiers that are, as Ball says, synesthetic. So that was a lot. What I want to do is take a moment again to just say visual here does not equal media. So Goldfarb, this is the critique you can critique me for. Goldfarb largely subsumes visual under media and basically argues for the computerized classroom. Again, a computerized classroom in a pre-millennial sense that I critique in a pre-pandemic sense and someone needs to be doing, and many of us probably are doing the work of what on earth this even looks like now and or can look like in you know, an imagined post-pandemic way. But importantly, the visual isn't media, not just media or not equated to media for that. And again, there's more going on from our senses as well for that. So when we're thinking through putting these words together, again, the linguist in me wants to go back to sort of um, definitions and the Oxford English Dictionary and, you know, thinking about our English language and the way we use it and what these words are. So pedagogy, to get us all on the same page, pedagogy is the art, occupation, or practice of teaching. Also the theory or principles of education, a method of teaching based on such a theory or those principles of education. Now, visual as a noun, so thinking about what Ball and Sirkin and Cartwright are up to, thinking about visual as a noun would be a visual image or a display, specifically a picture or that visual element of a film or television production. So this is that visual essentialism Ball saying we should be avoiding. Um, we should be avoiding just looking at the visual element of a film or television production and thinking about all the other um, pieces as well. So visual as an adjective then is pertaining to, concerned or connected with sight or vision. So for me, visual pedagogies are discrete methodological practices in teaching and learning of embodying processes and protocols concerned with vision and with ways of looking in our roles and identities as educators. So embodied and embodying practices and processes as a teacher. So not just who we are in our bodies, but how it's a present progressive ongoing living kind of breathing embodying practice and process as a teacher. And so as an academic drag queen, my own practices and processes are visually grounded. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go through the talk as well. So for visual pedagogies, to get to my work and approach, next note, note the plural here. So the plural pedagogies that's happening here now, rather than a singular visual pedagogy, I want us to think about plurality and visual pedagogies. So my work and approach is largely a riff on Brian K. Alexander's buy-in to the literal project of making case studies out of our own pedagogical practices. So Brian looks at and theorizes the classroom as an ethnographic site in which pedagogical engagements are active performances that not only orient people to information, but orient them to each other in a space that is always and already an engaged, staged, and audience performance. So the process of teaching and learning becomes actualized as a performative event. It's not a rehearsal for some future performance in that fantasized space called the real world. I often talk about this, that our classrooms are real, right? They're not these imagined safe spaces where we can protect our students from all the real things that are happening out there. And we often do talk as educators too about preparing our students upon graduation to enter the real world as if their four year or five year degrees with us are these you know, vacuum sealed kind of experiences. And yet Alexander's saying that every time we teach, it's real. It's not a rehearsal, it's not a, a kind of trying on or, or a piece for that, it is the real world. And what's happening there has engagement, 
has stages, has audiences, has wings. You know, you can unpack, and many theorists have, you can unpack all of the metaphorical connections between um, theater and performance and pedagogy as well to understand and think through this as not a rehearsal, as Alexander's saying, um, not a future performance for it, but an actual happening, an actualized performative um, event. So my scope and framework with this, when I'm thinking through how I do this in, a, in an, a quasi autoethnographic way, um, I started from studio art graduate work that was really visually oriented social justice educator theorizing the classroom as an autograph, autoethnographic site. So I started doing drag at the tail end of my first master's degree and doing my MFA work was all about, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a drag queen who does drag in the classroom, who goes to academic conferences in drag, who performs my research in drag, and what does this look like? Um, so it started from a studio art graduate background. It brought together this constellation of related concepts and thinkers to begin theorizing um, my academic drag experiences. And since a lot of academic publishing is kind of gatekeepers of knowledge and ways of thinking, don't really love the constellation approach to how we build frameworks and scope our research. Um, I've kind of clocked this into um, kind of three areas of transgender visuality, queer phenomenology, and visual performance. If, I, if I'm not allowed to give the constellation approach to it, but giving those kinds of thematic elements. Um, and that puts me, or I like to think of myself as the social justice visual pedagogy. And I do have an anti-imperialist inclusive education philosophy for me. So it's kind of the scope and framework um, that, that guides my work. Um, in my MFA, I auditioned for season five of RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, I now largely, so this is 10 years later. Um, so in 2012 is when I was doing my MFA work um, at the University of Windsor in Southwestern Ontario, literally the most Southern point of on Ontario and this nation we now call Canada. And auditioning for um, RuPaul's Drag Race was a key piece of the work that I was doing. Um, I did not get on the show, you know, spoiler alert, if anyone's not up to or past season five, um, I used to have to really really explain RuPaul's Drag Race. And so I'm not going to, because I'm going to make what I think is a fair assumption that most of us have at least heard of or are aware of this, you know, international global reality TV juggernaut drag queen competition. Um, but once upon a time, um, you know, I auditioned for season five of Drag Race. And now, 10 years later, um, my audition tape, a 12 minute um, audition reel, exists as an audiovisual autoethnographic essay in itself is how I think of it as kind of a foundation stone in my work. Um, and it is, as I look back on it, you know, critically self-reflective of who I was as a, as a baby drag queen and as a, a baby um, scholar, this is an early foray for me into theorizing self, body, and the body's potential visually and pedagogically. If you're interested, you can watch it. Um, so there's the Vimeo link and there's the password for it. Um, my chapter, as you might have seen, um, that this talk is based on, is forthcoming from Brill Sense um, Publishers, and this is part of it. So um, you, you're allowed to watch it. Um, I have published scholarly um, my audition tape as part of my work, which I think is kind of wonderfully radical. So you can screenshot this, or I forgot to ask, um, not actually, but I have a PDF of the slides if anyone wants them as well. So you can watch it. You can see um, what we're, we're thinking through. I don't have time to give us 12 minutes now to just pause and watch it together. So I'm gonna keep going. Um, but as you watch it, I'll have you kind of think back through some of the pieces that I've extrapolated from it, um, because I do wanna make sure we have time for, for questions and engagement. Um, but looking back critically on where I started as a baby drag queen, a baby scholarly queen, some kind of key tenets of my work and approach with visual pedagogies that I'll unpack each of before I move to a Q&A with us, is this idea of constructing and maintaining bodies. Also the idea of teaching, performing, and witnessing, teaching and risk, as well as teaching and change. And so for constructing and maintaining bodies, um, thinking of Judith Hammer's work on performance pedagogy, um, they have this brilliant phrase that says, we don't just teach or study bodies, we teach and study as bodies. And so that's that embodiment and that embodying piece is that as scholars, no matter our discipline, we're not just teaching and studying about bodies or teaching and studying this content. We have bodies and we teach from within our bodies as well. As Haraway says on bodies, bodies have been as thoroughly denaturalized as sign, context, and time to the point that bodies are not born, they are made. And what I love about this is this sounds like a very academic, you know, 1991 iconic Donna Haraway, 
caraway way of saying, as RuPaul often says, you're born naked and the rest is drag. So this idea that birth is a thing that happens and then all of this construction, all of this maintaining happens to our bodies throughout our entire life. And RuPaul calls that drag. Haraway doesn't quite call it that, but calls it that construction, that idea of making as well for that because of how denaturalized our bodies have become, especially in academic conversations where, as Hammer is saying, you know, we don't just teach and study bodies, we teach and study as bodies. So dragging bodies and teaching bodies are those kind of fun, punny phrases I like to think about that, you know, teaching bodies, you know, we are teaching bodies, right? The content matter is bodies, but we're also bodies that teach in a teaching bodies kind of way. And so for drag, same thing. You can drag a body, but you also can do a dragging body um, in that kind of sense for the, for the classroom approach as well. So thinking about teaching, thinking about performing and thinking about witnessing specifically, Bell Hook says that the idea of teachers as performers is meant to serve as a catalyst that calls everyone to become more and more engaged, to become active participants in learning. So again, busting in a critical pedagogy way, busting that um, hierarchy between learner and teacher, between student and teacher, between stage, you know, the, the stage and audience kind of piece for that, everyone becomes more engaged. We all become active participants in the learning. And so Hook says powerfully that the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. Again, it's not a vacuum sealed safe space that is a precursor dress rehearsal for the real world. It's the most radical place of possibility in the academy. And Ball says that knowledge, so going back to visual pieces, Ball says that knowledge is constituted or rather performed in the same acts of looking that it describes, analyzes, and critiques. So kind of like Hammer is saying, we don't just teach and study bodies, we teach and study as bodies. The same acts of looking in that visual way are also the same ways that knowledge is constituted and performed. And for Hooks' radical classroom space, that is where all that possibility in the academy lives and exists. So visuality as an object of study does require that we focus on the relationship between the seer and the scene. And so throughout my visual pedagogies, I position the seer and the scene as reciprocally myself and my students. And we're bearing witness through the visuality of my drag body. I look at my students, my students look at me. There's this reciprocal relationship of looking in a visual pedagogical way that's happening when through all the materials of drag culture I use to bring my feminine self out visually in the space of the classroom creates a very radical moment of possibility and witnessing is key for that. Of course this leads to risk. Elise Pinot in her essay says that performance-centered approaches to education are inherently and exhilaratingly countercultural at both the pedagogical and theoretical levels. Because what happens, Pino is saying, is that whenever any of us as an instructor emerge from behind that traditionally designated instructor space, right? Moving out from behind the podium or, you know, removing the sage on the stage and becoming the guide on the side kind of piece. Whenever we do that, our identities as experts become untethered, right? They're tethered to the podium. They're connected to that space at the front of the room, you know, often elevated sometimes by steps or pieces of that as well, or kind of gallery created where students are looking in at us in a kind of Thunderdome way. And what happens, you know, saying is that our identities become tenuous. When we move out of that space where we are experts at the front of the room, our identities are at risk. And to whatever extent you're wanting to kind of risk your identity, you know, I put myself, you know, full beating heart out in front of my students as a drag queen walking across campus, being in the space with them. You know, the, the extent to which the risk is involved um, can be vastly different, but without risk, we're not doing engaged pedagogy, as Hooks would say. So here's Hooks. Progressive professors working to transform the curriculum so that it does not reflect biases or reinforce systems of domination are most often the individuals willing to take risks that engaged pedagogy requires and to make their teaching practices a site of resistance. And that leads to change. So Hooks again says, there is not nearly enough practical discussion of ways classroom settings can be transformed so the learning experience is inclusive. And I wanna pause here for one moment because Hooks wrote this in the early 90s. So 1994 is when Teaching to Transgress was published. This sentence, I would say the needles moved perhaps not at all. 
there still is not nearly enough practical discussion coming up on, you know, three decades later of the ways our classroom settings can be transformed so learning experience is inclusive. You know, we have these ideas around EDI and we have these conversations we have, and they're not practical discussions. So when you're thinking, well, Tommy, we are talking about inclusivity all the time. We're not doing it practically. We're doing it theoretically. We're doing it at the level where we're almost saying, what if we did this rather than to hell with it, I'm doing it and let's see what happens. So 30 years later, there still is not nearly enough practical discussion of ways classroom settings can be transformed so the learning experience is inclusive. RuPaul says, whatever you put on after you get out of the shower is your drag. So in this kind of totalizing way where drag can literally be everything about how we visually signify, that does mean that folks who are listening to me talking are thinking, wow, Tommy, this sounds radical, this is engaging, um, but I'm not a drag queen, I'm not a drag king, I'm not a drag performer or a drag artist, how do I do this? Well, you can do this very clearly, as I say, by embracing your very teaching body in any pedagogical environment you're in so that you can present and represent and represent the plural truths of who you are as a self, as a teacher. And these can be very radical, where you take that critical pedagogy risk of vulnerability that Hooks um, challenges us to do, and you move out, you untether yourself from that podium at the front of the room, and you take a risk to be a real living, breathing human being with your students. I do that as an academic drag queen. You don't need to be an academic drag performer to do that. You just need to authentically be and share openly and consciously those plural truths of who you are as a self, as a teacher. And so to wrap up, I just wanna um, take a moment to reflect on kind of two cool things that I've noticed, um, again, pre-pandemic, but thinking as I grow as well um, in, in the pandemic, of things about my academic drag 10 years ago and then now, because it actually is, um, it was February of 2012 when I was um, auditioning for RuPaul's Drag Race season five. So in my audition tape, um, I say, for me, drag started as an academic practice in school, but it quickly became my life. And since my life is academic, it kind of worked out for me. I get to be a queen and a scholar and a fabulous scholarly queen. So that was me in 2012. Me in 2022, in my forthcoming chapter to being um, printed, um, says my academic drag as a visual pedagogy with its visual performative aspects embodies an aestheticized engagement with pedagogical intent of knowing, through witnessing the body. Very different approaches, um, and I'm still working and still thinking. And so I do want to share with you, since I couldn't share the, the videotape because of time, here are three stills from my audition tape of me teaching in various ways, studio modeling, teaching, you know, Titian's Donne painting, campily doing a, a lip sync number as well. This is my drag then, this is my drag now public scholarship, in drag, doing pieces of my work. These are both talks around gender pronouns and teaching one of my kind of signature areas. And August 6, 2020, in the pandemic, I was the keynote speaker for the Online Teaching Institute at the Center for Teaching and Learning here at the University of Alberta. Um, and then not even a full calendar year later, but August 1st, 2021, I took up my post as executive director here. So I am not stopping and I am going to keep going. And so using some of the languages we have across the station we now call Canada, I just wanna close by saying miigwech, marci, niawe, thank you, and merci for coming out today and listening to my talk and in advance for engaging in some of the Q&A and discussion together. Thank you so much. That was so fantastic. I'm going to maybe put us into gallery view. Um, and everybody still here and see me. I just, something flashed up that, that I was signed out. Are we good? I can see and hear you. Okay, great. I don't see anyone else though. So, I mean, if people are- if we No, want I'm trying to put a gallery view is, but it seems that we may have to ask people to, if they have their hands up, unmask themselves if they wish to be seen. <laughs> The webinar format is a bit of a challenge. I'm seeing uh, lots of people kind of thanking you for your engagement. Um, this is one of the, the good things and that, that we have about the chat, but uh, I'm having to summarize the chat. So if anybody would like to be unmuted to say anything, please raise your hand, um, offer a question. 
where the floor is open. I mean, maybe I maybe I will kick things off with a comment I just actually made in the chat, and I don't expect that you should be able to find the the chat uh, a, while you're actually doing things. But so, sorry, Tommy. No, I said it is a big chat. I just went to scroll, and the little icon is tiny. So um, thank you all for that engagement. But yes, go ahead, Pat. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on new pieces and revisit um, those after. Well, I'm just trying to think about how the pandemic changes things for us, and as you were talking about the ways our, you know, the fact that the needle has not moved at all since the 90s in Bell Hooks, that uh, it made me think, well, maybe it's the, the stubborn materiality of buildings and spaces that give us an alibi for not doing things differently, that the space acts as a scriptive thing. And I, I can see that in my own teaching sometimes, especially there are places at the University of Alberta where, say, the tables and the chairs are bolted down in a certain way that prevents you from rearranging the space. And then you kind of get discouraged because you can't have a circle or you can't move around or have students kind of uh, do things in three dimensional space or use their bodies to participate in any meaningful way. And so spaces become what Robin Bernstein calls scriptive things. Um, they kind of have encoded within them the tools of their own use. And I'm wondering if that is also happening now in pandemic land where Zoom, and this kind of returns to something you and I were discussing, I think at the very pre-beginning of when we were kind of setting up the webinar, that Zoom also makes certain demands of us. And, and I guess made me think, how do we shake up those alibis that we have for not doing things differently or for kind of not staying settled into the convention? And I bet you have a lot of great ideas for that. I do. I don't know if you're... I don't know if they're great ideas so much as, you know, just random thoughts or pieces, but I have been thinking, um, I've been thinking that the, the same thing around, um, you know, we often hear, um, you're right, not the, it, they're alibis right there. If only I could move the tables, my whole pedagogy would just resolve itself and be completely decolonial, right? And so we are hearing those same pieces with, you know, if only I were able to do, you know, breakout rooms differently or, or you know, these kinds of pieces for it. And so what I often come back to um, as an education developer now as, you know, uh, the executive director of the teaching center are reminding us of the way we need to align all the aspects of our teaching. So when you're designing a lesson, you know, you start with draft learning outcomes, you then bring the content in, you then think of, you know, assessment pieces, and then you don't just go teach it, you revisit the learning outcomes and you see how they've sort of gone. So what the pandemic is really um, forcing us to see is what are the physical and or now digital pieces we have to align as well. If you're teaching on Zoom, what are the capabilities and how can you use them critically, creatively, and I'd like to add now affectively as well. How do we bring affect into our teaching in a conscious way for ourselves as instructors as well as for our, our students? And so thinking about those pieces, you're not, it might feel like you're being subjected to the digital space or to the physical space for it, but Hooks isn't talking about a physical classroom. Hooks is talking about your classroom that you create as a space to engage your learners and you can draw attention powerfully and critically and affectively to those constraints without making them an alibi for if only I could have them gone I could do better because that's what the system wants us to think is I can't change the system I just have to work in it and we're all agents of the system working within it and it's up to us to decolonize and circumvent those pieces to say you know F this, I'm gonna do this this way and I'm gonna see how it goes. So um, I have lots of ideas kind of practically for some of those pieces, but um, I'll pause there because I think there are mm -hmm. other questions in the, in the chat too, but that is a great one, an important one for imagining post-pandemic pedagogies into existence. There are indeed, it seems like we need something, pedagogies in praise of misalignment or something. And that might in fact be a good segue to the question in the Q&A from Keith from the, from the chat who asks, how might we prompt or support our colleagues who've been trapped by imperial cis heteronormative patriarchal conventions to bring more of themselves to their performances of teaching and learning? It's, it seems like that's a, also a companion part of that big question, right? How do we kind of pull that what we like to think of as authenticity and sometimes you know that names a lot of different things but how do we pull that in yeah um something i'm struggling with conceptually and practically and ethically right now in my work in research is we're supposed to decenter dominant identities we're supposed to decenter whiteness we're supposed to decenter straightness we're supposed to decenter um you know sanism and ableism and those pieces 
And yet for folks who have intersections of being equity denied, but have a, a master um, you know, narrative, a, a masterpiece around them, it can be really challenging to decenter when everything's tethered to those pieces. And so I struggle with, by telling you to look at me as a white person, I know I'm centering my whiteness. Like I know I'm saying, look at me, this is a white body. But what I try to do in my work and try to do in that rhetoric is center it by calling it out, right? Like, like you know, not center it in terms of um, perpetuating it, but center it in terms of it's uncomfortable to talk about whiteness. It's uncomfortable to look at white people. It's uncomfortable to say race white, to, to think of whiteness as, as a racial category and identity. And yet it's so easy for us to slip into those kinds of ethnographic ways where we talk about other, um, other racialized identities, other equity denied groups in a theoretical, you know, about them kind of way. And so I, I think, and I, you know, it, it's risky and, you know, it brings vulnerability and pieces, but I think those dominant um, privileges that we have, those pieces we have, I think we need to lead with. We need to say, as a straight person, this is how I navigate the world. As an able-bodied person, as a sane person, you know, those sort of pieces. So we're, we're told not to talk about them by decentering them. And yet what happens then is no one critically talks about them because we're not supposed to talk about them. They become taboo. And so I, I say in my chapter, actually, uh, and it's wonderful being here at the University of Alberta where our president isn't actually the president I call to task in my chapter, but I, I say the, the inevitably, you know, straight, white, um, you know, cisgendered, able-bodied president, I've never heard one of them open a public address by sharing their pronouns, right? I've never heard them open with an unscripted land story around how they came to be. And there would be so much power in someone saying, I'm a straight, white, sane, able-bodied man, and I'm the president of the university. I understand X kind of thing. I know that centers all of that privilege in that kind of impenetrable body, but by calling it out, you know, it's like we remove the armor from it. You know, we, we, we make that vulnerable to say, I'm going to talk about this dominant piece of who I am, and I'm going to critically bring that into my, my reflective practice for it. Um, it's much easier and almost normal with moving to destigmatize the equity denied pieces, right? We often hear about, uh, especially in the Zoom world, we often hear about um, parents talking about, you know, you might hear my kid, you know, cry or something, or they might come ask for a snack and stuff. And yet before the pandemic, children was largely female identified and presenting mothers who would be, you know, I'm a single mother academic, or I have to leave early to pick the kids up or those sort of things. And that's coming from an equity denied place where we don't, we look at that differently than someone saying, I don't have to go pick up my kids today kind of thing and to talk about it differently. So um, it's not about, for me, and this is what I struggle with, with the centering, it's not about centering to perpetuate. It's about centering to destabilize um, those kinds of pieces. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of different um, sites of, and venues for questions here. Katie, I just noticed you had had your hand up and I was going to invite you to speak if you still would like to and then your hand went down or are you still willing to, I'm gonna allow, hit, allow you to talk and let you speak for yourself here. Take it thank over. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, Tommy, I was at your uh, CTL keynote in uh, August 2020. It was really uh, great to have you come back again and come back more and be here as a resource for us uh, going forward. So um, just at the time in the beginning of the pandemic, when we were starting to figure out how the heck are we going to do this? Um, it was great to start thinking about performativity and being able to interact with students in ways that are new, because a lot of what we've done in the past is often more about crowd management than actually the best way to interact with students, in my opinion. Um, the idea of this embodied teacher-student interaction being uh, crucial to, to learning and teaching is really one that I, I hear and agree with. And with the black boxes of Zoom, and when we're in webinar format, and you can hear me now, but you can't see me, uh, and the rest of us have no idea of knowing how many people are in the virtual room. There's no participant count. So we're weirdly disembodied and all the rest of you are as well. Um, we lose a lot, but I think we gain a lot as well. And being able to think about it in the ways that you've presented it um, helps me certainly 
reflect on some of the things I've started doing and I'm going to continue to do and tweak a little bit just to make sure that we are recognizing people's embodied forms in the classroom. Um, I can't hear them laughing if they're uh, that sort of that visceral, yes, I have made a room of 100 people laugh that you get when you're performing. Um, not so much as sage on the stage, which is an expression I hate, but as, as a somebody who's performing an interaction with a bunch of other people and, and getting that, making them do something differently with their bodies because of something you've said and made them think, all of that is really powerful. And I'm, uh, yeah, my mind's ping-ponging all over the place. So I think I'll stop there, but I just wanted to, to let you know that you're sending me in all sorts of interesting directions here for my teaching practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing that. And I'm happy to hear you're going in multiple directions, right? The plurality is important. There's not just one way to do things or not just a false binary way of doing things. Um, many, many, many different directions and different pathways. Okay, there's, um, there's also a couple of, there's one question in the chat and another in the, um, sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. Um, Jennifer Fisher Summers has asked as uh, requesting some uh, information in the chat about um, pro resources for instructors for teaching when we move, go back to in-person classroom teaching with respect to pronoun use for students. The online platforms allow us to put our pronouns on screen, but that's not the same as in the physical classroom. And I know there's great debate about um, pronouns, even among trans scholars, and some people have written as, as far as I know, uh, in my reading, against even trans people saying sometimes do, forcing people to use pronouns is not necessarily the best trans friendly practice. And I wonder what you can, what you, feel, what you have to say about some of this and some resources that people might find helpful. Yep, absolutely. Um, and yeah, first, first off, the, um, what tends to happen, so pronouns, and this is, a, you know, like I said, the kind of signature um, piece of my, my public scholarship, um, Pronouns are one of the easiest low-hanging fruit things for folks to implement in their teaching, and yet it has the one of the most um, dangerous ways that you can do it without critically and consciously thinking through it. And that tends to come up, not as you were saying, in the forcing of it, right? The you know the must fill out or must share your pronouns or a pronoun go round kind of thing for that. And so the the wise practice is um, consciously talk about how it's not compulsory right? Share them if and as you're comfortable, including on a daily basis, right? Like you could be comfortable in one space one day to share your pronouns and in another space could actually be like, yeah, no, this one's, this one's feeling a bit icier <laughs> than the other one was kind of thing. Or in our classrooms, a student could say or share something in an open um, kind of way that can shift the, the relative safety of that space to, to um, have um, pronouns or kind of different ways of, of being in the classroom. So it's not a, it's not a, everybody get a sticker and put it on you that says your pronouns or everyone make tent card kind of things for that. Um, depending on, on your um, class space or how you're doing that, those can be great ways to do that. Buttons, badges, those kinds of things where folks can grab a bowl, uh, you know, have a bowl of buttons and they can grab one that has their pronouns on it. You know, you can have the, hi, my name is, and then have pronoun pieces there. You can do them orally. So, you know, as the teacher, as you feel comfortable, because again, it's not compulsory for teachers either to share any or all aspects of who we are. But you in that space where you're the authority, you're the expert, for you to share your pronouns, even if they are, you know, cis binary kind of pronouns for that, that can create different kind of ripples uh, among your, your students for that and how you do it. So what I would say with the pronoun pieces, and I have tons of <laughs> resources, so um, email me specifically, but what I would say is careful, sustained and ongoing um, critical and creative reflection around how to do this in an empowering way not a procedural way is really important for um, opening up those spaces and as I call them those cultures of respect around doing this. Yeah it's so interesting um, as someone who is not necessarily cisgendered but but also doesn't always share pronouns my approach is is one of in some ways experimentation and solidarity with people whose pronouns aren't stable and and there's a lot of trans folks for whom transition is a process as opposed to a state of saying, I am X, right? And that sometimes if we provide the certainty of the identification of the pronoun, it, it kind of creates the illusion that gender is a stable thing. 
and not something that is in fact in, in flux or in, in negotiation in yeah. an ongoing social encounter. So I, I really like what you say about the not forcing part, but also opening a conversation about what pronouns can and can't do. And I think sometimes we have, we wish for the certainty around gender that gender doesn't necessarily secure for us. Like a pronoun can't really secure the, the certainty for the audience, right? That there's always something in excess that I think your presentation really gets at at the level of performance and, and embodiment, right? And there, I'll, just, I'll say one more thing before we go back mm -hmm. to another one of that, because there is not, and this is also really important for folks to hear and really kind of have sink in, there is not a perfect way to do this. There is always risk. There is always um, opportunity and, and um, risk and, and triggering that goes into it. There are ways that can be more inclusive or safer. So I often say, you know, when you're talking about like an imaginary student in the case study kind of thing, use the singular they pronoun. Right? Like, you know, just say, you know, a student reading this, what might they interpret kind of thing for that? But you can't use that same thing if you didn't, if you don't know a student, a real, you know, living, breathing student in your class, if they put their hand up, you can't say, oh, great question, you know, what they said was, because they might not be their pronoun. And, and so you could be mispronouning someone using an arguably inclusive gender neutral pronoun, you also, so then, then people will say, oh, well, great. Another practice would be, you know, ask for and use our students as names. Mm -hmm. Fabulous practice for inclusivity, right? To use someone's name and say, um, great comment. What was your name again? And Nat says Nat. And I say, excellent. What Nat said was, and then I repeat it for the whole group. But then yeah. that leads into kind of English white language superiority, where if you can't pronounce a student's name, you're actually further subjecting them to tripping over their name or doing that horrible thing where you say, oh, I just won't do it. Or the equally horrible, but oppositely, you try nine times to get it right in front of everybody. And so mm -hmm. there's always the, the, those pitfalls that come into this. And so this is where when we're thinking about the risk and vulnerability, it doesn't mean don't try and don't see what happens. It means mm -hmm. try, be ready to fail, be ready to react and respond, and then move in those ways where we keep learning, unlearning, and relearning how to engage as whole people. Absolutely. I mean, I think of something that Vivek Shreya said on, on uh, Twitter, where uh, she was critiquing the, the wish for us to universalize the they pronoun. And that just creates the fantasy of certainty and mastery that we will never get it wrong, yeah. right? And that it doesn't actually get into a kind of relational or embodied practice of, of engaging with people on the terms they, that they choose for themselves, right? And, and uh, doesn't allow for the misfirings. I think maybe decentering that wish for ma mastery at the center of pedagogy is something we all have to participate in. And yeah. maybe this actually is a good segue over. We have two questions open in the chat, and I think they might be related to each other. One from Rachel that says, oh, this is the Q&A, by the way, if you're following along. Um, can you speak more to how students are part of or can be part of this space? And Jennifer also asks, what are your suggestions for how we can start to create and apply more inclusive practices? And this does feel very much like a, a co-creation moment between students and, and pedagogues. And I wonder maybe if you want to speak to both of those concerns, maybe in the same breath, as it were. Yep, absolutely. Um, Co-creation is exactly where it's going to go. Um, or even put yourself as the teacher unambiguously as the learner. Um, we, we often talk as teachers about how, you know, we have that wonderfully horrible phrase where I've learned more from you this term than you've learned from me. You know, that, that horrible kind of thing we say to students where it's like, you're just as good kind of thing. Well, what if it wasn't a joke? Or what if it wasn't an ironic sentiment? What if we actually consciously said, you know, I don't know this, right? I learn every single time I go on TikTok, I learn new things about pronouns and I can barely keep up. And I don't know what to do in my public scholarship because I feel like I should actually just live stream, you know, folks' TikToks and we should have a discussion around them because language moves so quickly now that, you know, like, I'm mad that my chapter's not published because it's out of date because of the pandemic. And yet, you know, tomorrow, something I said to you folks today, someone on TikTok could be saying, this is triggering. And I'm like, great, you know? So um, actually, consciously, authentically, and vulnerably, have your students be folks who have knowledge as well, real knowledge, lived knowledge. Um, a kind of other guiding piece to my larger um, pedagogies is around um, public pedagogy. So the way that you know we think of, and this goes back to that idea of the classroom as this dress rehearsal space, but we have our students in a classroom space for a tiny percentage of their day 
of their week, of their year, of their life. Everything that's going on outside the classroom informs their teaching, learning, unlearning, and relearning as well. And so letting them bring pieces in, leveraging things over for them to write exam questions with you or by themselves, giving them the space to, you know, do research in class. You know, when you're asked a question and you don't know the answer to it, rather than say, as we're told to say, great question, I don't know, I'll get back to you. What if you turn that to a moment and said, great question, how do we find the answer together now? Get out your cell phones, get out your laptops. Let's, yes, let's start with Wikipedia, right? Like, let's go there. Let's see what we can find out as living, breathing research and learning in the moment for that. It shouldn't be the, I'm the expert, I'll go away and reflect on the question and bring back an authoritative answer. It should be, how do we do this in the moment? So yes to co-creation and yes to learning. Yes, to learning as teachers and, and to keep going. So um, bring students in, um, move toward those inclusive practices and honor the knowledges that our students have as real people. I love that. And I think also implicit in what you've just said there is the, is the taking a responsibility for the redistribution of authority into a classroom because we never just teach in isolation. We teach students who might've just come from a class with sometimes a very authoritarian kind of teacher and to own that sometimes students expect and can't always know what kind of teacher you're going to be. And so you somehow have to kind of consciously model the distribution of authority because I think sometimes it's not easy to trust that authority, the authority is redistributed, right? And to kind of constantly allow for that to be really, you know, shared and to comment on the, sh on the act of sharing while it's happening because it's not, it's not necessarily, even though we might say, oh, I've just decentered my classroom and empowered my students. Students don't always necessarily understand that that has happened because it doesn't happen in every pedagogical encounter. And so what I really liked about what you said there is the, the way in which you also not just do a thing, but talk about doing a thing, right? Here's, here's the thing we're doing together, right? And to emphasize the togetherness about it. No, and that's such a great point because it's not about, and this is why I struggle with, and so I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying I struggle with, I'm actively mm -hmm. consciously thinking through these models of decentering because it's not about removing yourself from the conversation of the classroom. It's about facilitating a conversation where you join it. It's about removing your authority and redistributing it. It's about sharing the process of learning, unlearning and relearning. So it's not about, it's not about I'm no longer the teacher, I'm no longer the authority, right? There's still duty of care. They're still paying attention to triggering comments, racist comments, you know, students who are shy or introverted or miss class that day or any of those things, you know, you still are the person who at the end of the day is assigning grades. But how do you do that metacognitively where you call into question those pieces and engage with those as actual parts of the curriculum, um, not hidden curriculum, actual mm -hmm. pieces of the, the learning and that's where that power is so you're 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 totally right that it's the that redistribution and the conscious modeling of how to do this so your students know and get to ask questions about the questions yeah yeah it's so important it's so important and and i see we're getting close to time but the other thing it makes me think about is the question of learning outcomes which sometimes feel like they can be blocks and i think of i guess i like to think of learning outcomes as one way that we can kind of work together on how we can describe the language of our own learning in that space so that it doesn't become the, the goal, like the end point, but the, the ongoing space where you kind of create language together so that you can kind of learn, use learning outcomes, maybe, I guess I can say this, kind of against the spirit of them, right? If they're supposed to somehow have been like this checklist of things, maybe there's a way to kind of use that impulse to kind of co-create a language about the shared learning space that is not against the scripting of the outcome, right? That it's not, you just kind of ticked off these boxes, but we've learned to kind of come to some language together for what has just happened across these months and spaces that we've shared together. My friends, it is 1.15. I feel like I've done a lot of talking. I wanna make sure that there's uh, nobody else whose voice ought to have been included here that um, I think we've got through the, the questions of the chat and the Q and A. Um, if you um, have not uh, or have had a question or a comment, I know that Tommy is very likely to be glad to receive them. And I don't know if you have contact information you want to add to the chat or a, 
um, your details at the Center for Teaching and Learning. If you're interested in more from intersections of gender, Rachel, perhaps you can add to the chat uh, the, the address for uh, signing up for our newsletter or so you can hear about other events. We also have a Facebook page. We're, we're really always glad to have new members of our audiences and to share the share the word and new presenters if you'd again like to um, join with us. And I'll remind you again, uh, please come again in two weeks for Dr. Colleen Norris, who will talk about heart health and intersectionality and the research that she's doing there. Um, but mostly I wanna say today, thank you so much to Tommy for this robust, exciting, fabulous engagement. It's gotten us all thinking and excited about teaching and learning and the spaces that we can co-create together. So thank you so much. This has been so amazing. Thank you, thank you. And I look at all these thanks rolling in the chat. Um, so, you know, the love is here, the love is here. Thank the you recording by the way. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming out. Yes, indeed. And we will have the recording ready within the next week or two. Rachel, you will know a little bit more about the timing of that. Maybe you can um, say in the chat next two weeks. Fantastic. And that will be as all of our other recordings have been available on the Intersections of Gender website. And please come and use them, share them. Um, they're a living resource for us all to return to these kinds of conversations. Oh, look, thanks from the Netherlands. Hello from Edmonton. Um, I guess it's time for us to call it a day, but it's so hard to say goodbye when you've had such a good conversation. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you for uh, making this space be the thing that it is and look forward to seeing you all next time. Take care, everybody. <laughs>